So you could classify vectors on three different criteria. You could classify them on the basis of functionality. You could classify them on the basis of host in which they are operational. And then you could also classify them on the basis of insert size. And again, there are subclassifications here. So, so in terms of functionality, you could have two types of vectors. You could have a cloning vector where the DNA fragment is amplified. However, no translation happens here. Then you could have an expression vector in which uh, not just amplification, but also expression of the protein of interest uh, happens. So that is your expression vector. In terms of the host cell use, the vectors can be classified as prokaryotic if they are resident in a prokaryotic cell. They could also be eukaryotic if they're resident in a eukaryotic cell. And uh, there could also be a class of vectors that could be initially resident in a prokaryotic cell and finally come to be into the final eukaryotic hosts. So this category of vectors that can exist both in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells are known as shuttle vectors. And then based on insert size, we've already discussed, you could have small insert vectors like plasmids and phages, and then you could have large insert vectors like bacterial artificial chromosomes, yeast artificial chromosomes, and mammalian artificial chromosomes. So we now move on to discuss the properties of the simplest vectors, that is plasmids. So let's enumerate the basic properties of plasmids. So number one, these are double-stranded circular extrachromosomal DNA. So if you see here, this is your double-stranded circular extrachromosomal DNA. Uh, this is uh, the structure of PBR322, the simplest plasmid that is known. They are semi-autonomous. They can replicate independently of the host DNA. And which is the important property that we look forward to in plasmids for amplification of our DNA. So so they have their own origin of replication, which is known as ORI. And from this point onwards, DNA polymerase can, can catalyze replication of the DNA. And that results in uh, their uh, capability to replicate independent of the host DNA, which is a very important point because that allows for amplification of your DNA uh, into uh, a large number of copies, irrespective of whether the host DNA is amplifying or not. The plasmids carry one or more selectable markers or genes, and usually these markers are antibiotic resistance genes. In the case of PBR322, you have two resistance genes, one that is known as tetracycline resistance. As the name indicates, once the plasmid is present in E. coli, the, the E. coli is conferred tetracycline resistance. Likewise, the ampicillin resistance gene is also present and confers resistance against ampicillin. So any E. coli cell that contains the PBR322 plasmid would be tetracycline resistant as well as ampicillin resistant. Some plasmids may have the property of integrating into the host chromosome in which case are known as episomes. This is not common to all plasmids. If you look at the size of the plasmids, the size of the plasmids is highly variable and it could be as less as one kilobases and as high as 250 kilobases. However, the ones that are used most commonly for, uh, for cloning purposes have an average size of five kilobases or slightly less. Most common type of plasmids that we use for recombinant DNA technology are high copy number plasmids and generally 50 or more copies of smaller plasmids will be present in a cell, allowing for amplification of the DNA fragment that you have inserted into the plasmid. Plasmids are a common feature in bacteria, but they can also occasionally be found in eukaryotes. For example, you have a two micrometer plasmid that is found in yeast. So just to recapitulate, here I show you the typical plasmid that is known as PBR322, but it carries all the major features that are required of a plasmid. So if this is double standard circular DNA to begin with. Then there are two resistance markers present in this plasmid, one for ampicillin resistance, and the other for tetracycline resistance. Uh, both these genes also contain uh, restriction sites that will be used for uh, integration of your uh, insert. And then of course, there is an origin of replication which is uh, coming from E. coli and can allow for replication of the plasmid independent of the host DNA. Next, we talk about the origin of PBR322 and it is uh, important to note that PBR322 is not a naturally acting plasmid and actually represents an engineered plasmid. So PBR322, which is the simplest vector, was actually uh, created in the laboratory of Herbert Boyer 
at the University of California, San Francisco in 1977 for efficient cloning and selection of E. coli. And basically it comprises parts derived from three different plasmids. So you have the ampicillin resistance gene, which is derived from RSF2124. You have the tetracycline resistance gene, which is derived from PHC101. And the origin of replication that is important for the autonomous replication of the plasmid in the host cell is derived from PMB1. Right? The size is small. Uh, the total size is basically 4361 base pairs. From This is the equal one side from where you start counting the nucleotides. So the first nucleotide is from labeled 1. And of course, as you make the full circle, the last nucleotide is labeled as 4361. And in that order, you start with first the tetracycline resistance gene, followed by origin of replication, followed by the ampicillin resistance gene here. Right? So this is a PBI322 plasmid. And now we discuss more about uh, the strategies of selection and amplification. So the plasmid is really small in size, 4361 base pairs in total, and can hold and insert not more than 6 kb in size. So next we check out the sequence of PBR322 in NCBI. So the URL for NCBI is ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. This is the homepage for NCBI and this is the URL ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. And here in this case, uh, in the homepage, you'll have all the databases highlighted. You got to move on and select uh, nucleotide here. So I'll select nucleotide because I'm looking for the nucleotide sequence for PBR322. So I select nucleotide and then in the search box, I get PBR322. And then when I say search, it will take me to the to the hits that match this. So here you are, if you see, the second hit is to the cloning vector PBR322 complete sequence. So this is what I want. I'll click on this here and that will take me to the PBR322 sequence now. Right? Now, sequence can be available in two different formats. So you could have a GenBank format and a FASTA format. Let me show you the FASTA format of the sequence here for PBR322. So here, if you click on the FASTA format, you will be able to see the sequence alone of PBR322 in the FASTA format. In the FASTA format, important point is that you'll have a greater than sign and then you'll have the initial uh, ID of the sequence followed by a very small annotation of the sequence telling you about what the sequence is about. So here, if you see, this is cloning vector PBR322, complete sequence. And then, of course, from the second line onwards, you have the sequence here. So this is your uh, sequence of uh, PBR322. If you want to see the details of what each part represents here, you could go back to the GenBank format here. So when you click on the GenBank format, this will now also give you the annotation. So if you see here, there are several fields and uh, locus. It says this is 4 to 6 one base pair of DNA, circular, and then it gives you the date when this sequence is deposited. Uh, then definition, it says cloning vector PBR322, complete sequence. And then of course, there are accession numbers that are given to you and version and other things. And then you will start with features here. Features include your location qualifier. So this is 4361 base pairs of DNA. So starting with 1 to 4361. The organism name is cloning vector PBR322. Molecular type is other DNA. It is not the host uh, chromosomal DNA. Then you get an idea of where your, uh, where your tetracycline resistance gene is present. So this is 86 to 126, uh, 1276 base pairs is your tetracycline resistance gene and this is the translation of the protein that you get from this region here then of course if you move on there are other features mentioned and then if you look at the other protein that is encoded by this plasmid that is that is your beta lactamase and then of course there are other important things followed by the actual sequence here right so this is your sequence uh, left indexed you have the numbers here and this is your 4361 nucleotide found here. This is how you can retrieve the sequence of a, of a vector that you want to for, or, uh, for your detailed information. So let me take you back to the presentation now and we move forward and look at the other features of this plasmid, including the selection strategy here. 
So here you are, this is your sequence of PBR322. Uh, I have copied and pasted here for your uh, convenience. Uh, this is again taken from NCBI. And then let's have an activity as well so that you are awake and you are attentive. So here is the question here. Which of the following represents the simplest plasma? PBR322, Paquet, and Paquetine. And I'm sure you would be able to answer this without a problem uh, since we have been discussing about it for some time now. Okay, so let's now look at the restriction map of PBR322. Uh, so here we are, and we use NAB cutter to draw the restriction map of PBR22. Here you are, and this is your uh, restriction map of PBR322. This is 4361 on base pairs. This is your tetracycline resistance gene. Then this is your uh, beta lactamase or ampicillin resistance gene. And you have the start of the counting at the EQR1 site here. And then, of course, as you can see, there is a fair distribution of restricting sites along PBR322 all along, right? So this is uh, what is your restriction site here. Over 40 restriction sites with unique cleavage sites on PBR322 genome are found. 11 of these sites are within the tetracycline resistance gene, which is this one here. And two, which is CLA1 and HIN3, are found within the promoter of tetracycline resistance. Uh, six enzymes are found within the ampicillin resistance gene, which are marked here. Uh, thus, cloning in PBR322 with the aid of any one of these 19 enzymes will result in insertional inactivation of either the tetracycline resistance gene or the ampicillin resistance gene. So let us now sum up the features of PBR322 plasmid. So here you are. The DNA of interest or insert may be inserted into any of the resistance genes here. So it will be interest, uh, inserted into tetracycline resistance gene or the ampicillin resistance gene. Whichever gene the DNA of interest is inserted into, the cell becomes susceptible to that specific antibiotic. Right? So let's assume that the insertion happens within the tetracycline resistance gene, in which case the cells that undergo successful recombinant transformation, which means that the insert is got inserted into tetracycline resistance gene, and this plasmid is transformed into the host cell, then those cells would be susceptible to tetracycline. So to select for recombinant transformants, essentially what we're looking for are cells that are ampicillin resistant, but tetracycline sensitive, because our DNA of interest has got inserted into the tetracycline resistance gene. This gene is inactivated. However, ampicillin resistance is intact. So in this case, the recombinants will be ampicillin resistant and tetracycline sensitive, right? And this is a strategy that can be used to identify your recombinants. So here on top, I represent the population of cells that you get after the transformation experiment. So if you look at the sensitivity with respect to antibiotics, these cells, because they do not have a plasmid, these will be sensitive to both tetracycline and ampicillin. These cells here, which are uh, basically transformants, but with the cell fragmented plasmid, here both the tetracycline gene and the ampicillin resistant genes are intact. So these cells would be resistant to both tetracycline and ampicillin. And these ones here, the cells of our interest, the actual recombinant uh, transformants, these would be uh, tetracycline sensitive because the insertion was in the tetracycline gene, disrupting the tetracycline resistance but they would be ampicillin resistant because, because the gene for ampicillin resistance is intact in these plasmids here. So now the question is, how do you identify your actual true recombinant, true, uh, recombinant cells uh, from the non-recombinant transformants? So first, of course, you want to eliminate uh, the non-transformants from your population. So you simply plate the transformation mix onto a ampicillin positive plate. So these cells, because these are ampicillin sensitive, all of these cells would die off. And only cells that can survive in this plate are uh, the non-recombinants as well as recombinants here. So you have a population of cells that are uh, either these type of cells or they would represent these type of cells. So now I represent them with blue dots and green dots here. So these are your blue and green dots here. So these represent your non-recombinants as well as recombinants. And from here now, you want to identify the cells that are your true recombinants. So for that, you do a replica plating. And when you do your replica plating, you replicate the plate onto a ampicillin as well as tetracycline plate. So now you know that your recombinants are tetracycline sensitive. So therefore, when you do a replica plating, your recombinants will not grow here. Only the blue cells that are your non-recombinants grow here. So only the non-recombinants grow here and the recombinant cells do not grow here. 
So now you can compare the two plates and the colonies that are missing in the ampicillin positive to second positive plates, but present in the ampicillin plates are the ones that are your true recombinants. So this is a two step based selection that you do to finally arrive at the cells that are your uh, recombinant cells. So the colonies that grow in the ampicillin positive plate, but not in ampicillin and tetracycline positive plates carry the actual recombinant vector. So now that we have gone through the selection process in PBR322, one major question that I want to ask you is, what are the major limitations of PBR322 and why did we need to move on to other vectors like PAK8 and PAK18? So here is your answer. First, of course, is that the selection process is uh, slightly elaborate and it is a two-step selection. You have to plate the cells twice to actually get to the final recombinant transformants and that too in indirect manner. A one-step color-based assay for differentiating recombinant transform cells from the non-recombinant ones would be more convenient. So to address this limitation, we moved on to PAK8 and PAK18, which can basically give you a color-based selection and this process is known as blue-white screening. We'll see this in details as we move along and we'll also go into the molecular basis of blue white screening. Then, of course, the second important uh, limitation with almost all plasmids is the maximum insert, insert size that they can hold. So not more than five to six kb of insert can be cloned into PBR322 or other plasmids and that is a major concern. The key enzyme involved in blue white screening is beta galactosidase. Beta galactosidase is an enzyme that is made up of two distinct functional parts, the omega fragment and the alpha fragment. So, so here I show you a cartoon of beta galactosidase. It is made up of four omega polypeptides and four alpha polypeptides. The omega polypeptides can polymerize only in the presence of alpha polypeptide. If the alpha polypeptide is not found, then the omega fragments cannot uh, uh, polymerize with each other, forming a tetramer. And because the polymerization does not happen, therefore a functional beta galactosidase is not formed in the absence of alpha polypeptides. So the, key, the two key constituents of beta galactosidase, the omega fragment and the alpha fragment, are equally important for the final assembly of a functional beta galactosidase. It is one of the three enzymes encoded by Lacoperon. Beta galactosidase is critical to survival of the bacterial cell and the basic function of beta galactosidase is to metabolize lactose into glucose and galactose. In the absence of glucose, upon induction of Lacoperon, beta galactosidase converts lactose to glucose and galactose. So the question here now is how do we use beta galactosidase as a marker for recombinants versus non-recombinants? So in this case, the host cell's DNA itself is modified so as to ensure that there is a mutation in the beta galactosidase gene and the beta galactosidase gene is able to synthesize only the omega fragment and not the alpha fragment. So in the PUT series of vectors, the host cell DAXI gene is mutated and can produce only the omega fragment and not the alpha fragment. And remember, in the absence of alpha fragment, omega fragments cannot tetramerize and when they are not able to tetramerize, you do not have a functional beta galactosidase. So in such cells where the host lacks the gene is mutated so as to ensure that the alpha fragment is not synthesized, uh, if you still want to functional beta galactosidase, the only solution is that you provide the alpha encoding region in trans through a plasmid. So the alpha fragment can only be synthesized in trans by the non-recombinant plasmid and this is the strategy that is used to identify uh, recombinants from non-recombinants amongst the transformant population. So as an activity, I want you to name the three enzymes encoded by the lacoperon. So let's see what happens during the synthesis of beta galactosidase in a mutated host cell. You have your uh, mutated laxi locus in the host cell that synthesizes only the omega fragment and is not able to synthesize a functional alpha fragment here. So therefore, this uh, omega fragment dimers are inactive and cannot perform the function of beta galactosidase. However, what you can do is if you could provide the alpha fragment that is synthesized through the sequence in the plasmid, then of course you could have the formation of a functional beta galactosidase, and this could then perform the function of breaking down lactose to glucose and lactose, providing the necessary energy for the cell. Right? So in this case, the omega fragment is coming from the host cell. The alpha fragment can come from the plasmid and this is again very important that the plasmid 
that can synthesize alpha fragment would be the one that does not have the insert or the non recombinant plasmid because the mcs or the multiple cloning site has been very intelligently placed inside the lag z prime locus lag z prime locus is the one that codes for the alpha fragments so when the insert is present the lag z prime locus is disrupted and therefore no synthesis can happen however if it is a self ligated plasmid then the alpha fragment can be encoded in trans via the plasmid shear. Active beta collectisidase is a tetramer. As is shown here, there are four omega fragments and four alpha fragments that join together to form the functional beta collectisidase. Right. Each monomer is made up of two parts, the lag Z alpha and lag Z omega. So in the non-recombinant uh, transformants, the omega part comes from the host cell, the alpha part comes from the plasmid. And the two combine together to give you a functional beta galactosidase, right? The M15 deletion and lag Z gene in the host cell deletes the alpha fragment. So the omega fragment cannot tetramerize by itself, and therefore you do not have a functional beta galactosidase. However, the functionality can be restored by providing the alpha fragment in trans via the plasmid here. So this is your alpha fragment coming from the non recombinant plasmid and forming a functional beta galactosidase in combination with the omega fragments here. And this process is known as the alpha complementation process. So let's look at how blue-white selection allows you to discriminate between non-recombinant transformants versus recombinant transformants. So here is what is happening. The host cell is mutated and therefore it cannot synthesize the alpha fragment of beta galactosidase. It can only synthesize the omega fragment. And the problem is that the omega fragment cannot itself polymerize and give you a functional beta galactosidase. So therefore, what we need for the polymerization of omega fragments is the alpha fragment. In case of non-recombinant transformants, this alpha fragment is provided by the lag Z prime locus in the plasmid, which is also holding the MCS. So here in this case, what happens is that the Non-recombinant plasmid would have an entire lag Z prime locus, which can synthesize alpha fragment. And this alpha fragment can then combine with the omega fragment derived from the host cell, forming a functional beta galactosidase. Right? So this is what happens in case of the non-recombinant transformants, which have a self ligated plasmid, where the lag Z prime locus is intact. And therefore, the alpha fragment can be synthesized. And these alpha fragments then combine with the omega fragment to form the beta galactosidase. However, in recombinant transformants, because the MCS is in the lag Z prime locus, the lag Z prime locus is itself disrupted by the insert. And therefore, no alpha fragment synthesis takes place here. Effectively, there is no functional beta galactosidase because the omega fragments cannot polymerize by themselves. So therefore, there is no beta galactosidase function found in the recombinant transformants. Right. Now, how do you discriminate between the recombinants and non-recombinants visually? For that, you use what is known as X-GAL, and X-GAL is converted into a blue-colored product upon uh, the presence of beta galactosidase. So here you are, this is your X-GAL, so X-GAL in the presence of IPTG is the inducer for the, uh, for the lacoperon. Once the lacoperon is induced, you have the formation of beta galactosidase. In case of non recombinant transformants, resulting in development of blue colonies here. So, blue colonies are because of the conversion of X gal to blue color by beta galactosidase. In the case of recombinant transformants, there is no functional beta galactosidase, and therefore, X gal is not converted to its blue colored product. And therefore, you have these white colonies versus blue colonies. Blue colonies are the non recombinant colonies white colonies are the recombinant colonies. So this is typically your blue-white selection. Uh, you have the spectral plate which has been plated with your transformants and you can see distinctly there are some colonies that are blue in color and then there are colonies that are white in color. The blue colonies represent your uh, non-recombinants, the white colonies are the ones that represent your recombinant. So in the blue colonies, uh, X-GAL uh, is converted to its blue colored product. Uh, while in white colonies, because beta galactosidase is not present because of the lack of the synthesis of alpha fragment, you have only white color and no conversion of x to blue color. So white colonies, uh, these are colonies with recombinant plasmids. 
large Z-prime is disrupted in the plasmid and therefore functional beta galactose base is not formed here. And then you have the blue colonies. The blue colonies are the colonies with self ligated plasmid where the lag Z prime locus is, is undisrupted. Therefore, a functional beta galaxy base uh, is formed upon the combination of the omega fragment from the host and the alpha fragment from the plasmid. This acts on XGAL to give blue color product upon induction by IPTG. Right? And these are your full forms. The XGAL stands for 5 bromo 4 chloro 3 indolin. Beta D galactoparanoside. IPTG stands for isopropyl thiogalactoside. So here is how a typical path vector is formed. Path vectors are derived from PBR322 by modifications. There is no tetracycline resistance gene here. You have only one resistance marker, that is the ampicillin resistance marker. You have the equal origin of replication to ensure that the plasmid can autonomously replicate. The tetracycline resistance gene is gone. We have the addition of Laxi prime alpha, which is the locus from where the alpha fragment of beta galaxidase is synthesized. Also, what is done is that the MCS or multiple cloning site is within the Laxi prime alpha locus. So now when they when you have a recombinant plasmid, the Laxi prime alpha locus is disrupted and therefore this cannot synthesize a alpha fragment. However, in a self-ligated plasmid, the Laxi prime alpha locus is intact and therefore this can synthesize the alpha fragment which can then combine with the omega fragment from the host and give you a functional beta galactosidase. So that's the whole strategy behind blue-white screening. Park vectors are derived from PBR322. Only the ampicillin resistance gene is present. And there is no restriction enzyme within the ampicillin resistance gene. The tetracycline gene is replaced by the lag Z prime locus. This codes for the alpha fragment of beta galactosidase. And very innovatively, the MCS is within the lag Z prime, and the MCS has been expanded to contain a lot more restriction sites than are present in PBR322. And the selection process is based on the lag Z prime expression. And as I said, a functional beta galactosidase is formed only when the lag Z prime locus on the plasmid is intact, which essentially implies a self ligated plasmid. And this is assayed by the blue color of the colonies in the presence of XGAL and induction of lycopron by IPTT in the host cells. So the process by which a defective beta galactosidase gene in the host cell is complemented by the expression of the alpha fragment through the plasmid and trans is referred to as alpha complementation. And path vectors are high copy number plasmids. Uh, each cell can contain as much as 500 to 700 uh, path plasmids. Path 18 vectors can work with modified host cells where there is a deletion in the in the lag z gene so as to ensure that the alpha fragment is not synthesized from the host cell and only the omega fragment is synthesized from the host cell and therefore a functional beta galactose base it cannot be formed by the host cell alone the alpha subunit is encoded by the lag z prime locus in the plasmid and importantly the lag z prime locus here also contains some multiple cloning sites so if the insert of interest comes and sets here then, of course, your lag Z prime locus is disrupted and you will not have the synthesis of functional beta galactosidase. However, in cells that contain a self aggregate plasmid, the lag Z prime locus is absolutely intact. And therefore, these cells can synthesize a functional alpha fragment, which can then complement the omega fragment from the host cell and give you a functional beta galactosidase. Thus, in recombinants, the alpha polypeptide is not synthesized, hence, no functional beta galactosidase is formed. Right? However, in non recombinants, the lag Z prime locus is intact, the lack of prone is induced by APTT, and XGAL is rendered blue by beta galactosidase. The alpha subunit is encoded by the lag Z prime locus in the plasmid. So, here, if you see, this is the lag Z prime locus in the plasmid. And very interestingly, the MCS of multiple cloning site, which is a series of recognition sequences for restriction enzymes, is present within the Lag Z prime locus. So if you have your insert uh, ligated onto this locus here, then your Lag Z prime locus is disrupted, and therefore a recombinant plasmid cannot synthesize the alpha fragment. Whereas a self ligated plasmid can synthesize the alpha fragment here. So importantly, the Lag Z prime locus also contains the MCS, and the placing of MCS within the Lag Z prime locus allows you to control the synthesis of alpha fragment of uh, the beta galactosidase 
in recombinants no alpha fragment is synthesized in non recombinants the alpha fragment can be synthesized and therefore leads to the formation of a functional beta galactosidase thus in recombinants the alpha polypeptide is not synthesized hence no functional beta galactosidase is formed here in non recombinants however the lag prime is intact the lac operon is induced by iptg and xcal and rendered blue by the functional beta galactosidase that is synthesized in non recombinant transformants right thus when the cells are grown in ampicillin plates with iptg and xcal the uh, the non recombinants turn up as blue in color because of the synthesis of functional beta galactosidase and the recombinants turn up as white in color because the xcal is not converted to blue colored product Uh, in the absence of a functional beta galactosidase so while blue white screening solved the purpose of doing a one step selection for plasmids the other major limitation of plasmids remained that is the the maximum size of the insert that you can have in a plasmid is around 5 kb uh, you can stretch it to a max of 6 kb but not any more and many a times your insert may be of a larger size depending on the experimental objective that you want to achieve for example in sequence so one of the major limitations of the plasmid vectors that is two step selection process was removed using blue white screening however another major limitation with this with respect to the size of the insert that it can hold remains so not more than 5 to 6 kb of the insert can be held by a plasmid and therefore the search for alternate vectors began and uh, uh, this yielded several alternate vectors so starting with bacteriophages which we will discuss in the next lecture now right Uh, but before we close this one here i want you to again do an activity and enumerate for me the role of the following in blue white screening beta galactosidase xgal and iptg